I work at the University of Copenhagen, where I tell students lies, such as that they can write multi-threaded C programs and have them run correctly. And then I also work in the intersection of programming languages and high-performance computing, where we have this, this hope that we can make functional programming run really fast on GPUs and other exotic architectures. We are, I work in a small team together with Cosmin Wancher, Philip Mungsko, Robert Schenk, Martin Elsman, and various other students that we can get to do, to do work for us. Um, but let's go back to when I was first a student. I, I was taught that I was taught functional programming, and I was mode, and my teachers told me that functional programming was a great thing to learn because the future was going to be all about parallel computers, and functional programming was great for parallel programming because when you have no side effects, the order of evaluation doesn't matter. Like in, in an expression like this, if we have pure sub-expressions g x and h y, we can evaluate those in parallel and still, still get the right result. Okay, so that was how they motivated functional programming to us. Um, well, it's the future now. Uh, where is all the parallel functional programming? So why hasn't parallel functional programming taken over the world? And you can say that, well, it has actually, because there's lots of parallel programming frameworks and libraries that are really built on, the, on functional concepts, things like ACA and Scala, or TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, Accelerate. Lots of these libraries are a build on functional ideas. Some of them are even implemented in functional languages. But I was a kind of naive and stubborn student, and this wasn't really what I understood when my professors told me about parallel functional programming. What I want to know is, uh, why can't I just take, write a functional program the way, uh, the way I was taught and have the compiler turn it into efficient code or for, for example, a modern GPU, which is a very parallel Computer processor that is useful not just for graphics but all kinds of, of general purpose computation. Um, that's, that's what I thought my professors meant. Maybe they didn't, that was just, maybe that was just how I understood it. But now I'm the professor and my misunderstandings are now kind of my, my career. So I want to make this true. I want to just have people write function programs and then turn them automatically into efficient parallel programs. Um, so why didn't it just work out the way I thought it would? Well, the reason is that, sure, if you have an expression like this in a functional language, then it is correct to parallelize the sub-expression. You'll get the right result. Um, but it, you might not get it, as, get it very quickly, because uh, a normal functional programming is going to have an enormous amount of very fine-grained independent work. And on a current modern computer, it's very expensive to actually schedule all that work. It's going to vastly outweigh the advantages of parallelism. Um, this is, not all, this, this is not always true. If you actually, if you were at the, the keynote yesterday, you would have seen a, some work on compiling functional languages to hardware. There you can actually exploit very fine-grained work, but if you're compiling a functional language to run on hardware that actually exists, then it's, not, it's very difficult to efficiently and automatically exploit tiny uh, amounts of, of parallelism. Um, and I'm, as an academic, I'm kind of I'm a very practical guy. I, I like to write programs that run on computers that actually exist. So that makes me very pragmatic for an academic. In particular, I'm very fond of trying to make consumer hardware that, actually, that already exists more accessible through functional programming. And that's why I like GPUs. Um, I don't like GPUs because I work for NVIDIA or anything, because I don't. I like GPUs because they are interesting and very widespread example of a, uh, a kind of computer that is potentially very fast, but very difficult to program manually. It's, it's difficult to try to, to write a to program a GPU directly. So if you can use function programming to make them more accessible, then we're making a great amount of compute power accessible to, to more people. So the research question that, that, that I work on is, how do we go from idiomatic functional code to the kind of low-level programming that a modern GPU, or for that matter, a vectorized CPU, um, expects and needs to run fast? And here we have this weasel word, idiomatic code. Uh, what does that mean? So one kind of, of idiomatic and common functional code is writing recursive functions over fine-grained structures, like, like linked lists. And that kind of programming is not realistic to translate to efficient uh, GPU code, because again, you, have, you may have some independent steps, but a linked list is a sequential data structure. To get to the end of the linked list, you have to go through all of the, all of the links. So it's not very well suited, and, and recursion is, is inherently sequential. But there's another kind of functional programming style that is also very widespread and is very suitable for parallel programming, and that's the idea of programming with bulk data transformations. So in functional programming, you have this, you have this entire vocabulary of map, reduce, or fold, scan, filter, 
they may have different names in different languages, but almost all function languages have these to some extent. And it's, we, we, once we move beyond our very basics of function programming, this is how we tend to start structuring our programs with these more high-level um, concepts, this high-level programming vocabulary. And this kind of vocabulary is very well suited for parallel programming because they all are about um, processing, transforming big chunks of data at a time. And that means that if we want to map this to a, um, some parallel hardware, we don't have to worry about, every, about tiny chunks. We can just take an entire map, for example, and figure out, well, how do we take this entire map on a big array or a dictionary or whatever and, and execute that in, in parallel. So basically, this is how I want to write parallel programs. So the, the language that we're seeing here I'll, is, is the language that we're working on at, uh, at our department to, um, to investigate some of these ideas. It's, it's called FUTHARC. It's kind of at least common denominator language. It doesn't have very many unique features. It just has kind of the stuff that is unique to most, most um, function languages with a few novel parts, but the, novel, the language design isn't really the, the important part. Uh, but even this small example does show a, 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 a a kind of novel thing in the type system. So this function is called dot prod. It computes a dot product. It says that it takes two arrays of uh, single position floating point numbers, F32, that must have the same size. The size is n. So that's, that's the novel part. The type checker will check that you pass it arrays of the same size. But the actual definition is pretty conventional. Map 2, that's called uh, zip width in Haskell. It just doesn't map over two arrays simultaneously. So it element-wise multiplies the elements of the vectors x and y gives us back a new vector, which we then pass to a function called sum, which is written with a reduce, reduce is more or less equivalent to a, to a fold. So that gives me a dot product function. I can then use that to write a matrix multiplication. And here I just use map. I map over the rows of A, and then inside of the function I'm mapping with, I map over the columns of B, and I do that by mapping over the rows of the transpose of B, and then I have a, a row from A and a column from B, and I take the dot product of that row and that column, and that gives me a matrix multiplication. So this is how I like to do, to, to do parallel function programming. This is how I, I program functionally. I write with maps and reduces, and I have inside of my maps, I may do another map. This is actually a fairly sophisticated example of, of parallel programming because it uses nested parallelism. I have a parallel construct, the map, and then inside of that I have another parallel construct, and then inside of that I have the dot plot, which has even more parallelism. I'm not going to talk too much about the problem of nested, the problem of nested parallelism, but that's a, a distinct challenge that's, that's kind of tricky, because hardware doesn't really have the notion of nested parallelism. It has a thing, just a few fixed levels of parallelism, and figuring out how to map multiple application levels to a fixed set of hardware levels is difficult, but that's not going to be my, my, my main uh, topic today. So again, the language called FUTHARC, it's pretty con conventional. It's, it's, it resembles many existing functional languages, slightly different syntax in some places. It's mostly interesting because we wrote a compiler that can turn into efficient GPU code. Um, also efficient uh, multi-core CPU code, but that's, that has received less development. So it's, it's very much the least common denominator language. It use, it's usable and useful, but we're using it mostly to investigate compilation techniques. So let's talk a little bit about GPUs. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but we need to understand what they're good at and what they're bad at and how they work in order for the rest of this presentation to make sense. So for reasons I'm not completely sure about, a GPU function or program is called a kernel. It has nothing to do with an operating system's kernel at all. It's don't, it's, there's no resemblance at all. Uh, a GPU kernel, when it runs, consists of tens of thousands of threads, or, or maybe one, but usually you would have, have many, and they all run the same code. Uh, and that's the trick. By having tons of threads running the same code, the GPU can more efficiently execute them and schedule them because it doesn't have to, to uh, have a lot of different programs loaded in memory at the same time. So this is an example in some pseudo code of what a, such a kernel might look like. It uses C-like syntax, but it doesn't practice there. They are programmed in, in C-like languages. So when all threads run the same program, how do, they, how do you actually do some work with them? Because how would they not just do the same thing? And that's the, th the trick. They do kind of all do the same thing, but on different parts of, the, of your data set. So a thread can ask for its, its ID, which is a number from zero up to however many threads are, are running. And then based on that ID, which I call I here, we can read from the input, input array, for example, put into a local variable. Threads do have their own local variables. And then we can, for example, check if that variable that we read is less than zero, and if so, we flip it and write it back to memory. So this would be a GPU kernel that 
takes an array of, 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 of integers, you would launch it with one thread per element in the array, and then it flips all the negative numbers to be positive. So the interesting thing, apart from all of the threads running the same program, is that to a large extent they are also running the same instruction at the same time. So the GPU splits the threads into what is called warps, which are of 32 threads on, on NVIDIA GPU, and at the same time, in the same clock cycle, all of the threads in the warp will be executing in lockstep the same instruction. So you'll have 32 threads executing that get thread ID function, which is some kind of primitive. Then you would have 32 threads executing the uh, read from memory from, uh, from R. And then you would have 32 threads doing the control flow. But here they're doing local control flow. It might be different between different threads. So there's some, um, so they will still all execute the, uh, the code inside of the body. But for the threads where the condition was false, the result will just be ignored. That's called masking. Um, and that means that in a, on a GPU, you can't use branches to hide um, work. You kind of always pay for all the branches, even the ones you don't take. Now, that's, it, if, you're a G, if you know about GPUs, you'll know that's a simplification. It's a little bit more complicated, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it simple. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is that at, at the same time, neighboring threads, threads within the same warp, will be doing the same work. They will be running the same instruction. And you cannot continue uh, to the next instruction or until all of your sibling threads are done with that instruction. And that raises some interesting problems, because not all instructions execute at the same speed. The most important one, the most important counterexample here is, um, is memory access. Because let's consider this read from the array i. Um, since i is the thread ID, that means that, th that neighboring threads will be reading from neighboring um, elements, uh, neighboring ad addresses in, in memory. And uh, a GPU is a, is a processor much like a CPU, where there's a long distance from where the computation happens to where the data is stored in memory. And they are connected with a bus. And on a GPU, that bus is pretty long. It has very high latency, but it's very wide. So when you read from an address in, in memory, when you say, give me whatever is stored at this address, you get not just back the word or the byte or whatever at that address. You get a, a kind of relatively large chunk of all of the surrounding data as well. So when you're executing on behalf of these 32 threads, a memory load, and those threads are, want to access um, addresses that are close to each other, then one trip to memory can satisfy a lot of these loads. So you do one memory transaction, it's called, and then maybe half of the threads in the warp will be, will be ready to continue. But they still can't continue until all of them are done. So then you do another transaction, and they're all ready, and you can continue. So that took us two transactions, and then the threads can continue. Now, if the threads in the warp read memory addresses far from each other, then maybe one transaction only satisfies one of them. And then you need to do lots of transactions sequentially in order to get to um, satisfy the reads that the threads need. So it's very uh, inefficient on a GPU for threads that are close to each other to access memory that is um, distant from each other at the same time. This is called, um, when, when, when you access memory close to each other, that's called coalesced memory, and otherwise it's called uncoalesced. So this notion of coalesced memory access, highly structured memory accesses, is something you definitely want on a GPU. It's usually the bottleneck in GPU programming, accessing memory. And getting this right is difficult, especially for a function language, because by this very nature, the way we write functional programs, they tend to be very irregular. They tend to have lots of dynamic, dynamic behavior. They don't have very regular memory accesses. So compiling a functional language to GPU is very difficult, and it's not yet fully solved. And I won't, at the end of this talk, have told you how to compile an arbitrary Haskell program to GPU. Unfortunately, not. Maybe in 10 years. Um, so the trick we're using, and we're using very aggressively, is to simplify the problem by removing language features and hope that programmers don't notice. And to the extent that they do notice, we explain how to circumvent those limitations. So I'm going to significantly shrink your idea of what a function language is until we can fit it on a GPU. And the main thing I'm going to talk about is the value representation. So the, main, the most important and fundamental thing is that you need unboxed data. Normally, in a function language, a value is a pointer to somewhere on the heap where the, where the data is actually stored. Um, and that's pretty inefficient on a GPU because there's no reason to, ex to expect that, that the values accessed by neighboring threads are actually going to be stored in neighboring locations in memory, not with traditional compilation techniques. But if you unbox values and you store them in registers, for example, then, well, they're right there. You don't even need to go to memory. So the main f and most important thing initially is to unbox everything. That also means that, that tuples, for example, normally they're stored as a pointer to somewhere in, in, in memory where you can then find the elements. Instead, in, in Foodwork, 
we take apart all tuples and just treat them as distinct variables. That means they're kind of passed by value, so they become more costly to pass around large tuples to functions. Um, but that uh, tends to be um, better than, than, have, than ending up with uncoalesced memory accesses. Um, we also have records, which is a syntactic sugar for tuples. So I will use records for some, in some of my examples, but just read them as, as tuples. So they are represented the same way. OK, so the main way you get the problem with the monomorphization is that it requires you to know the size of, of, of your values at runtime. And when you have a polymorphic function like this swap that just takes a tuple of A's and B's and returns a, another tuple with a B and an A, then the compiler doesn't know just by looking at this function how big these A's and B's are going to be. In a normal functional language, you will they would have the same size because they would just be a pointer. So that's 64 bits. And who knows what's at the other end? This function doesn't care. But that doesn't work for us. So we use a technique that is pretty well known called monomorphization, where we look at every use of this function and look at what, kind of, what types are it actually applied to. And then we generate a specialized version for each distinct um, type of the, uh, that the function is instantiated to. So that means all polymorphic functions end up being specialized, a little bit like how C++ templates work, if you're familiar with those. That results in, um, in an increase of in, in code size. Um, but we've noticed that in practice, most highly polymorphic functions are these kinds of small boilerplate uh, bookkeeping things that you probably want to inline anyway, because they don't do a lot of work. They just move data around for you. So it, this is not a big problem in, in practice for us. It just it does slow down compile times, though. Um, so let's talk about arrays. Those are the most important type for us. They are the main aggregate data structure in, uh, in our language. So let's consider a two-dimensional array. In FUDARC, an array is represented is a, a, for, a, to, the, to the programmer. It looks like an, an array of arrays, so just like a list of lists would in Haskell or any other functional language. And I'm coloring the rows here because I'm not going to care about the values, but we'll be working with these, uh, these four rows. Now, the nice thing about this programming model is that it makes it very easy to operate row-wise. For example, if I have this matrix and I want to sum each of the, each of the rows, I would just map a fold over it. And this is also how you would do it in, in F sharp or Haskell or whatever. This is how you do functional programming. And this is the programming style that we want to support. But then how do we actually store this array in memory? Well, the normal way of doing it and how you would do it in, in a normal functional language is to have a an array with four elements, one for each row, and then each, that array contains a pointer to where the, the row is stored in memory. Um, that's just how we do a, a list of lists. And this is, this is fine uh, as on a CPU, sort of. But on a GPU, it has the problem that consider when we, when we want to do, ex execute this, this uh, map with a fold. Now, the fold is sequential. So what we're doing here is we are launching a GPU thread per row, and then that GPU thread does a traversal, each thread does a traversal through its row. Um, so when we, when we start running, we, the threads, they, remember, they run in lockstep, they run at the same time, they will each want to read the first element of each row. Okay, so that's conceptually what they do. If you look at the kind of addresses they want to access in memory, then that's the, the bottom four blue boxes. And there's no reason to expect that these are anywhere close to each other in memory. So probably we would need four memory transactions, or the GPU would, in order to read all of them. So we kind of lose a lot of parallelism. It's, this just becomes uncoalesced access. It doesn't look so bad when you only have four of them. But if you had 10,000 of them, that you would kind of lose a lot of parallelism by doing it this way. So this is bad. And yeah, so it, then they all move on to the next element of the row, and, and so on. And each of them is a long series of uncoalesced memory accesses. OK, so that's bad. What about instead representing it in memory contiguously with, each, with, with the rows just appended to each other? This is called a, a row major layout. Well, we have the same problem. It may, it's, maybe it's not as bad depending on, this, on the length of the rows, but you still have a gap. So at the same time, the threads will be accessing memory distantly from each other. So it's still uncoalesced. Um, so the best representation for this problem is to store the columns consecutively in memory, or we can also view it as storing the rows in an interleaved form. And then when we, read the, when we need to read the first column when the threads because due to the lockstep execution, they will also be reading a contiguous um, part of memory. And this gives us a coalesced memory access. And the GPU can, in one memory transaction, read all of the, an entire column. Maybe it needs more if it's a very large column, of course. Um, 
So this is, this is the layout you would need in order to efficiently exploit the memory bus or the memory architecture on a, on, a, on a GPU, depending on how you access the array. So the trick here is that the optimum representation always depends on what the code is actually doing. Um, and that means the compiler has to look at what's going on and figure out what's optimal. In this case, it's the so-called column major layout. Um, so here, the, 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 the thing here is that we provide a programming model where the programmer can reason in terms of arrays of arrays. That's a semantic model, but the in-memory representation is dense, and the layout is decided by the compiler. You don't control memory layout in a, in a language like this. Uh, and the key language restriction that makes this possible is that arrays must be regular. That's so that's a um, jargon for all of the rows must have the same size. So for example, this, you can have this in Haskell. You can have a list of lists where the first element has three elements and the next one has two. That's okay in any functional language, except for this one. Um, here we do require that the elements have the same size, and that's enforced by the type checker. So if you get this wrong, the compiler will yell at you and tell you to fix your program. And fortunately, uh, we are function programmers, so we are very accustomed to the compiler yelling at us and telling us to fix our program. So even though this seems like a very harsh restriction, it turns out to be easy to understand. Sometimes it can be a little tricky to, um, to change your program so that it, it, it upholds this, this property, but you're never in doubt about why the compiler is yelling at you. And that is a pretty standard function programming experience. We did have to extend the type system with some somewhat novel features to make this um, work and, and somewhat ergonomic. Uh, but th and this issue doesn't just arise when you explicitly construct a multidimensional array. Like consider you're doing a map with some function on some array xs, uh, and inside that map, we are constructing inside of the function, we are constructing another array somehow. We have some code that makes produce an array as an intermediate result. That's, that can happen. Um, so in the map, each iteration of the map is done by a separate thread. And if each of those threads then just allocate memory for this array B when they need it, then you can end up with the, the different threads having the intermediate results located in random places in memory. And when they want to traverse it, they end up with uncoalesced accesses, just like the list of lists example I gave. Um, so what the compiler has to do in this case is it has to look at the map, figure out how many threads are needed, like here N, look at the sizes of the intermediate results that the threads will need, here M, and then pre-allocate a memory buffer and then store the intermediate results for each of the threads interleaved in memory again. And again, that may, the specific order may depend on um, how, how this array B is actually used. Um, maybe it shouldn't be column major, maybe it should be row major, maybe it should be something more exotic. That's, that's up to the compiler. Um, but this doesn't just occur for when you explicitly program with multidimensional arrays. It also occurs when the control flow gives rise to something that can morally be, be seen as, as multidimensional. Okay, so that's just array of primitives. Um, I talked a little bit of, now we, now we have an idea of how to handle arrays of primitive values. What about arrays of tuples? I mean, they, they occur. You want to use those in function programming. So when you have an array of, for example, of pairs of uh, integers and bytes, how should we store this in memory? Well, one way is to just store them consecutively. So first you have the integer, then you have the byte, and then you have the next integer, then you have the next byte, and so on. The problem with that is that now for here for the, uh, the second integer starts at an offset of five inside of the memory block, and that means you want to read it, that gives you an unaligned access. And that's maybe, maybe slow, maybe not allowed by the GPU, so that, that's not so great. Uh, the typical solution to this, which is used by, by C compilers, for example, is to do padding, so you just round up the size until you get a, an, a, a proper, until you get a, a alignment. In this case, we're adding three padding bytes so that each tuple takes up a full eight bytes. Uh, this wastes some memory, but okay, mem that can be, you can, we can survive that. Now, the real problem here is that if you imagine um, mapping a, a function on a, such an array here, then the first thread, the, I mean, each thread will be, will be one, one to read in the, the tuple, and they will start by reading the, um, the i32s. And that means that there will be a small gap, either one by one byte or four bytes, depending on whether you use padding, between the addresses accessed by the neighboring threads. And sure, that's a small gap, so maybe it'll still be reasonably coalesced, but if you have a large tuple, then it can be a very large gap, and you end up with the same problem as with the row major array. So just storing tuples consecutively in memory is, is not going to be particularly efficient. Um, so what Futhark does, is that we use a representation called uh, tuples of arrays, where sure the programmer might program with an array containing tuples, but the compiler will internally rewrite it to be multiple 
to be multiple arrays, each of primitive types. So if we have an, uh, an array of pairs, as before, the compiler will turn that into a pair of arrays, an array for all of the integers and an array for all of the bytes. This is a pretty common transformation in high-performance programming, in, in any language, really. It's called struct of arrays in C and Fortran and, and, and such. And it's usually done by hand, which sucks. It's really annoying to do this by hand on when you have large records, and it breaks modularity, and it makes maintenance more, more difficult. Um, but it's actually not too difficult to do in a compiler automatically. And it only affects the internal language. So as a programmer, you don't have to worry about this. It just happens behind your back. You still work with records and tuples at the, at the surface level. So now we know how to, how to uh, handle arrays of tuples. And we'll fall, be falling back to that um, a little bit later. So higher order functions are also problematic on a GPU. And the reason is that normally you compile a higher order function to a function pointer in an environment, and then you just jump along the pointer whenever you need to call the, the function. Uh, that's not great on a GPU, because if you, your threads are all jumping to random addresses found in function pointers, then it's very unlikely that, that there will be anything regular about the execution. So you will, again, it becomes irregular. GPUs hate irregularity, your code will be slow, if it even runs. Some GPUs don't even support function pointers. Um, fortunately, the 70s also had a bunch of people who didn't like function pointers. One of the grand old men of computer science, John Reynolds, he didn't worry too much about GPUs in 72, but he had a static analysis technique that didn't work for higher order programs. He, they'd only worked, worked for, for first order programs. So he came up with a technique called defunctionalization for turning higher order programs into first order programs. And the idea is to replace lambdas, anonymous functions, by a value that just contains the free variables. That will consist, con con that's the, the closure in the, uh, in, the, in the lambda. And then replacing every function application with a big branch that checks, okay, which function am I implying here? And then picking it. So it turns functions into data. Um, now, this means we can get rid of function pointers. It's still not great on a GPU, because it means every single function application becomes a big branch, and GPUs don't like branches, especially if they really don't like huge branches. Also, having arrays of these things is probably going to be very inefficient, because that would be an array of a sum type, and I'll mention a bit why that's problematic, especially when you have many constructors. Um, so we, we use this technique, but what we want to accomplish is to ensure that whenever you apply a function, you don't need to insert a branch because you will already know which function is there. What you don't know is what the free variables are, but you'll know what the function looks like. Uh, and we do that by, again, restricting the language. Um, so for example, we, we require that conditionals may not produce functions, so if may not return a function anymore. That's because if you have a function f produced by an if, then when you apply f, you have no idea which of the original, which of the lambdas inside of that def definition are actually the ones that are going to, going to be applying. So we have a, a augmented our type checker such that it will complain and yell at you if you try to return something from an if that is higher order, which just means it's a function. Uh, or I'm sorry, if it's more than order zero, which means it's a function. Um, similarly, arrays may not contain functions, because if you have an array of functions and you are indexing that array with some runtime value, you have no idea of knowing the form of the function that you're you are applying. Um, so that's, an, again, a type-based restriction. And we have a few similar restrictions for some other language constructs that I won't get into. And the, 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 again, the, the philosophy here is that we shrink down the language to enable better code generation, because there are lots of very flexible, very powerful function languages. I, I like Haskell myself. Um, but there are, so if you, if you just want a powerful language for expressing very rich thoughts, you go use Haskell or OCaml or F Sharp or Scala. But if you want a very fast language, then you can use one of these restrictions. And sure, you may not be able to think as freely, but you will, it will run much faster. Um, and of course, one of the nice things about being in academia is that we can f uh, do human trials by forcing students to use our language and see what happens. So we have forced students to use this language and see, okay, these restrictions, are they a huge problem in practice? And it turns out, um, contrary to our original intuition, that for the kinds of programs that you want to write um, in a language like this, you, you, know, you often don't even notice that these restrictions exist, and they have easy workarounds when, when you do. So it, it's not quite as bad as it, as it looks. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, is some types, um, or algebraic data types. Um, so these are, of course, important. That's another functional language feature that we really need to have. And the normal way in a function compiler that you represent these is that um, you have a value indicating which constructor that, that is active 
and then you have a pointer to the payload for that constructor. For example, here we have a, a Fuzak sum type. In Fuzak, constructors are prefixed with a uh, with an octothorpe or, or a hashtag, because of course the privilege of writing of designing a new language is that you can decide which color to paint the bike shed, and I painted it this way. Um, but it's just a sum type of two constructors, either a 2D vector or a 3D vector. And in a normal language, if you have a, had, have a value with the vector constructor, you would have a pointer to well, the two-element tuple, otherwise you would have a pointer to the three-element tuple. This is, this is actually a, quite a nice representation because it composes well and it never uses more space than necessary. And what I mean by it composes well is that if, you would, if we then have a, an option type, for example, then we can just take one of our sum values and put it into a, a sum and um, it'll just point to the, uh, the original value. So you don't have to think about the whole, you can think about small parts at a time and just put them together. Um, unfortunately, this is a very pointer-heavy representation, so it wouldn't run very fast in a GPU. You would have no way of knowing where things are in memory. You would have no way of laying things out so that they would be accessed efficiently. If you have a code like this inside of a thread, then, well, you don't know statically whether you will even need memory for the sum case. How, how would you? Because you don't know at run, until runtime whether you will be returning a sum or a none here. So it becomes pretty awkward. You, it raises lots of uncomfortable questions. Um, and memory access becomes uncoalesced because arrays of these things just become arrays of pointers. And you have no idea where the, where the things are actually stored. Um, and that's not so good. So in Fuzak, we, we already looked at how to handle arrays of tuples, so we implement some types by turning them into tuples. And then we can use an existing solution and everything will be, will be right in the world, um, sort of. So the idea that we do, yeah, we, that we use, is that we, when, to encode a sum type like VEC here, we turn that into a tuple containing an, an integer identifying the constructor. That's the i8 here, that'll be like 0, 1, whatever. And then we just store all of the possible payloads of the different constructors. So in this case, we have VEC2 and then a VEC3. And then to encode a VEC2 value, we put a zero for the constructor, and then we store the actual VEC2 payload, and then we put in some dummy values for the VEC3 payload that is not being used. And similarly for VEC3, we do it the other way around. Um, and then we turn this, this is a nested tuple and a record. We just flatten it out and, and represent it using how, the same way we represent any other tuple. Now, this has some problems. Um, oh, the main problem, of course, is that uh, the, the space needed for a value of a sum type is the sum of all the constructors. So you can't save any space this way. That means that I mean, this VEC here is going to take up one byte in memory and then five floats, uh, which is kind of inefficient. So another way of implementing this that is used, for example, by, by Rust, is you still have the tag, and then you have your payload, but the compiler would just look at, the pay at all of the possible payloads and just pick the largest one and reserve space for that. Okay, that's how Rust does it. And that's, that still has some overhead. You're still paying the cost of the largest possible case all the time, but you're not paying the sum of them anymore. Uh, unfortunately, um, this has the downside that it doesn't work with the, array, with the tuple of arrays transformation because that, that depends on being able to take things apart and store a bunch of arrays of primitives. So it's very, if you use this representation, it becomes very difficult to automatically do these coalescing optimizations. So in, in, in we made the, the, uh, the, the design decision, and that's, that's a, a trade-off. You can go either way. That is more, efficient for us, more important for us to ensure efficient memory access than to ensure low memory usage. This is, some, this is maybe not always the right way to go, but that's the way we went. Um, and unfortunately, because it's a high-level language, it doesn't really expose ways for you to, to manually change this. Um, but this, so the, the thing here is we then have to, to just to teach programmers to think about how they use some types and, and not do things that are extremely um, inefficient given this uh, compilation scheme. Now, we are doing things a little smarter than I explained so far, because in many cases, the different sum types, uh, constructors will overlap in what kind of values they, they need to store. And we do a kind of deduplication, such that if you have multiple constructors that have uh, integers in them, then they use the same integer slot in our representation. That we don't actually duplicate that. So that can cut down the duplication somewhat in, in many cases. Um, for example, I wrote a ray trace at one point that used a sum type like this for representing materials. 
um, where deduplication de gave a factor of two speed up just by removing shrinking the, uh, the memory footprint. In fact, this constructor here is kind of a best case because all of the actual values that are stored are just F32s, so floating point values. So the overhead here is completely the same as as, as you would have with the sum. Uh, sorry, with the Rust style representation where you're taking the the maximum, because that's that's perfect deduplication across the uh, the constructors. Okay, so these are these are the um, these were the value representation things I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about. And all of this is, of course, motivated by performance. And of course, I can't end a talk like this without talking a little bit about performance. This is not going to be a very systematic <laughs> description of why, when Futhark is fast and when it isn't. But I mean, I have to show some numbers. So let's talk about matrix multiplication again. This is actually the only Futhark program I'm showing here. So is this fast? Well, on an NVIDIA GPU I happen to have available, because NVIDIA gave it to us. Thanks, NVIDIA. Um, through that, I can multiply matrices with these sizes in about four milliseconds. So is that good? Uh, well, that's always a tricky question. I, we usually measure performance by taking someone else's programming, seeing how, how we compare against it. So let's take Kuplas, NVIDIA's highly hand-optimized matrix multiplication uh, function or library. It runs in about half that time, so it's about two times faster than Futha. Um, and this is not terribly unexpected because matrix multiplication is pretty much, it's not just business critical, it's more or less industry critical for, for AI. So NVIDIA has spent uh, as much money as needed to get this function to run as fast as it possibly can. So we think that FUTHARC for this kind of primitive is, primitive is within a factor of two of the speed of light of matrix multiplication on, on this GPU, which I think is pretty good for a high level language, but realistically, Foodwork will not be competitive, primitive for primitive, compared to handwritten code written by experts. Like if you wrote a Fourier transform in Foodwork, it would also be slower than, than QFFT, no doubt about it. So the interesting thing about a high-level language isn't just to do this drag racing against um, low-level programmers. It's to look at application performance and how much easier is it to write a program that still runs pretty fast. So if you look at things like, uh, like um, another benchmark, something extracted from a Monte Carlo neutron transport algorithm. I think it simulates what happens inside of a nuclear reactor, but I'm not completely sure. I just wrote the code. I don't understand what it does. Um, then this is compared. This is a, these are Futhark ports of, of handwritten CUDA code written by someone who's a pretty good CUDA programmer, but who didn't have as long as it takes to get it to run fast. And we see Futhark actually, for one of these benchmarks, matches the original performance exactly, which is very unusual, um, mostly because it's so unlikely that it matches to the digit. Uh, and, on another, and on the second one, it's about 20% slower than the handwritten version. So the handwritten version is faster, for, for not, not for particularly deep reasons, just small micro-optimizations and so on that the com compiler cannot do. But of course, I would argue that the food dog programs are much easier to understand and more high level easier to modify than the, than the handwritten versions are. So this is closer to what I think you can normally expect when you write a food dog program um, compared to a handwritten low-level CUDA GPU program, unless you are one of NVIDIA's GPU experts, and you can probably beat Futhark. But if the program is large, you won't have time to actually do it, because it takes a long time to, to write hand-optimized GPU code. OK, so the conclusion here is that functional programming actually is good for parallelism. I mean, that, it's not my, my professors were right. Um, but many of the classical features, like recursion and linked lists, they, they are not, and boxing and polymorphism, they, they, are, they are not very good for parallelism. Locality and regularity are the two central things that you need to get, to, to get right if you want truly high performance. And functional programming, unfortunately, makes it very easy to build highly irregular things. Um, some optimizations and transformations are known that can help turn irregular code into regular code, but they make trade-offs that are not necessarily right in every situation. And we don't yet know of, of a grail transformation that will just always work and always produce optimal code. Um, so for now, things we have to restrict the language in order to provide particular performance and to an extent to, to compile it at all. Um, so that's the trade-off. You get a slightly more restrict, restricted language, but in return it runs much faster. Um, sometimes that's the right way to go, sometimes it isn't. But the nice thing about functional programming is that the restrictions can be expressed in the type system. So it's not like the compiler will run and then a little bit later it'll say, oh, internal error, I can't handle this, change your programming in some unspecified way that I cannot truly describe to you. It likes to tell you up front, there's type error here, based on these formally described type rules, and here's an Elm style tutorial on how to fix it or whatever. Um, so function programming, I think, is actually very good for parallelism, and it's a very good foundation, but it still requires lots of hard work. Okay, that's all I had to say. Excellent, thank you.
we have time for, for some questions. Any questions here? Thank you. Um, I was curious, uh, I, I saw that obviously the, um, the NVIDIA's matrix thing was more optimized, but I was curious if you have any benchmarks compared to like uh, CPU running uh, matrix multiplication like in Haskell or something like that. So comparing the GPU to the CPU? Yeah. Okay, it's way, way faster than this CPU is ever going to be, like factor of 20 or 30. <laughs> have there been any cases where it actually was uh, slower? Uh, oh, yeah, so algorithmically there are some problems that are just not very well suited for GPU computing. Mm -hmm. uh, Matrix multiplication is not among them, but there are things like um, writing a compiler, for example, ironically. There are compilers that run on GPUs, but they are kind of more like research toys. Mm -hmm. Just sure, It's a big deal when someone actually does it, <laughs> um, and, and they're not that much faster than a CPU compiler. So anything based on, on graph things or trees or, or various sequential things are a bad fit for GPU programming, and Foodlack doesn't solve that problem. It's up to you to find out where the parallelism is and say, well, here's a map, here's a reduce, here's a filter, um, but if you can't do that, then it's not going to be parallel. Hello. Uh, would it be possible to have FooFart bounding, uh, bindings with a less restrictive functional language so that you can have the speed of FooFart when you need it, but then also the expressiveness of a high-level language when you don't? Uh, yes. Um, I've, I mean, so most of our research is about the compilation strategy, and I can, I can definitely see how it would be possible for a compiler that compiles a, more a, a bigger language to identify parts of the program that stick to a smaller subset, maybe with a program annotation, and then use this, the same techniques that we do to generate more efficient code. Um, I'm a big fan of things like stage programming, where you write your programming in multiple levels, so you could have a high level, a very flexible, powerful program that generates a more restricted low level program and then passes that on to a, a Foodark like compiler. Uh, I should mention that Foodark is not intended as an application programming language. It's only for, it's, it's pure, so you can just write well, computational functions. It's supposed to be called from other languages. So it's, it's always assumed that the rest of the, pr of the application will be, will be written as something else for doing I.O. and talking to the user and, and, and calling the Futhark program. So it, it's not a general purpose language. Uh, so two questions, really. Can you call CUDA libraries directly from Futhark? This first question. Uh, I can answer it. Then yeah, yes, I'll answer that first then. Yeah. At, right now, you can't call CUDA perf libraries from Futhark. Um, that's something we want to do. The, the difficult thing is that, that that requires passing a value from Futhark to CUDA, and Futhark has decides on its own value representation, and it might not be what is expected by the CUDA function. So we need to kind of do some translation there. It's not conceptually difficult. It's just technically um, diff tedious, uh, but it's something we definitely want to do because sometimes you do just want to call CUDA's matrix multiply function because it's so fast. Okay. So, and the second question was, so you had the CUDA programmer uh, transliterate CUDA to Futhark. Um, how functional was the code that he generated? Because, uh, uh. Or, or is CUDA actually already a functional language in disguise. No, no, CUDA <laughs> is a very low-level C-like imperative language, so it was not functional at all. Now, the only thing that is a little bit functional is that the, a CUDA kernel or a GPU kernel is in some sense equivalent to a map, but you can do things inside of it that make no sense for a map, like you can communicate between the different threads, and I haven't talked about that, but that's possible. You do ad hoc indexing, you need to... So the, the tricky thing about taking a CUDA program or any a low-level parallel program and, re and porting it to Futhark is to look at this kind of mess that they made and figure out, okay, this weird loop, oh, that's a filter. This weird loop, oh, that's a scan. So you kind of have to, to, to deconstruct uh, the intent behind the program and find the parallel algorithm, and then you can write it in Futhark. It's sometimes easy, sometimes it's really tedious. Thank you. We don't have time for any more live questions, but trolls will stay here, so uh, anyone who would like to keep talking, please uh, join him after. The talk and please again help me thank Trolls.